What would happen if you could stop worrying so much about what your team was doing all day and instead focus in on what you're supposed to be doing to move your business forward? Sounds like a dream, but right now you're living the nightmare of having to overcoach, overhandhold, and overcheck in on your team's work. Let's put an end to that and instead roll out super clear five hour work plans drum beats, and more of my signature tools that drive accountability and self-sufficiency deep into your team. All you have to do is join a Leadership Lab program, and I'll help you turn your team troubles into triumphs. You'll be learning and growing alongside some peers that will become valuable business friends. So why not go beyond this podcast and join us? It could be the smartest thing you do this year. Book a call with me and see what program would best fit you over at the website, stackingyourteam.com slash programs. Hello, leader. Do you have the team culture you've always dreamed of? Have you been able to truly create a workplace where everyone enjoys being a part of? If not, would you like to hear about a few things that you could do differently that would create a shift and where your team would immediately notice and appreciate the difference? I'm sure you do. After all, that's why you've tuned in. It's a bit of tough love today, so let's get to it. And by the way, none of these improvements that I'm going to share with you today cost any money. For real. Welcome to the Stacking Your Team podcast. If you are a service-based business owner who's wanting to elevate your capabilities to lead your team, you're in the right place. Clients tell me all the time that it's hard to find trainings and insight that fits them, that small business owner who's great at what she does, but never really had any training on the people side of running her business. That's exactly why Stacking Your Team was launched over three years ago as a companion resource to the award-winning Biz Chicks podcast, hosted by Natalie Ekdahl, our CEO and founder, who has been sharing her incredible free podcast resource for women entrepreneurs since 2014. Natalie and I both have a big heart for service-based business owners who are juggling life at home, in their community, their industry, and of course, in their business. We want to walk alongside you on that path towards profitability, impact, and harmony in such a way that you remain true to you. I'm your host, Shelley Warren, your team and leadership coach here at BizChicks Inc., where I lean on my 25 plus years experience leading people at a Fortune 50 corporation. I'm here to help you by taking those complex corporate concepts and stripping them down into what better fits you, that small business owner who wants to learn all the things about leading high-performing teams, being adored by your clients who will stick with you for years, and winning every day at operational excellence. Thank you for joining me, and as we come together today, as usual, when I mention an episode or a person or any little thing, you can always find the links in the show notes. And for our long-standing listeners, you know I can't start an episode without reminding you that the team that got you here may not be the team that will get you there. Before we start today, I want to share a five-star rating and review with you. It's from Sarah's IME. I so appreciate when people take a moment to leave me a review. You know, that's how you tell a podcaster that you appreciate her. So Sarah titled her review, Actionable Advice. And she says, this show is excellent if you need actionable advice for coaching your team and growing your business. I've used Shelly's recommendations from the very first episode I listened to, and it's been a tremendous help in working with my small team. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so happy to hear that the show is helpful to you as you are leading your team. Okay, let's talk about some easy team culture improvements. Every business owner, regardless of its size or location, has a culture. Even businesses that are 100% supported by remote team members with no street address or a waiting room or a kitchenette to hang out in when you're on break. They all have a team culture, even those startups who haven't been in existence for very long. Mm -hmm. They have a team culture too. So as a leader, are you paying attention to the culture you want or are you settling and fretting about the culture you've got? 
Are you hoping things will change? Maybe that new hire will cause the shift. Or maybe that team member that you just promoted into a leadership role will do the trick. Is that what you're thinking? I'm so glad you've tuned in today, if that's true. Most CEOs take great care in defining their core values, sometimes known as principles, that they believe will foster the culture that they desire. Of course, this works best when the team is involved in defining those values or principles, and there are measures in place to bring those core values alive each and every day in your workplace. There are members of the Leadership Lab that are exceptional at this, and boy, oh boy, is it ever a delight to see this. They know that the culture is not a set it and forget it kind of thing. Everyone has to want it, want it enough to keep an eye on it and assess it. Notice when there's drift and work hard to bring it and everyone back into the fold. It takes adult conversations especially those sticky ones, and an atmosphere where professionalism matters and where sharing different points of view is welcome. Teen culture is a long game, and there are many factors that fold into it, such as your team members and all the uniqueness that they bring, the kind of work everyone does, how you do your work, and how you collaborate and talk with one another. It all matters. That's why when things go adrift or when one person disrupts what you've got going on, it will immediately impact everything. Sometimes the disruption is exactly what you needed. Other times, the disruption is awful, and it takes a lot of effort to repair the damage. And that damage is costly. So leaders have to keep themselves in check and develop a high level of self-awareness so that they can stop themselves before it's too late before they unintentionally or intentionally mess up their own team culture. You know, it's common in the leadership lab calls to hear something, a tone, a word, a phrase that I encourage my clients to switch up for an immediate change of state, change of energy, and definitely a change in the relationship she has with her team. So today I'm going to share with you five practical strategies that offer up a chance for you to make slight changes in how you bring your vision to life and build solid working relationships with your team by switching up how you talk to people. Are you ready? Some of you may find these uncomfortable, but that's okay. You're open to considering different points of view, considering learning something new, and definitely I know you can do hard things. So here's the first one. Stop using we when you really mean you when you're delegating or giving direction. And here's why. Your team knows that you personally are not going to be involved in the work. So just say so. I used to work with a leader and, you know, unfortunately, there was a running joke about her. We stopped counting how often she said, we will have to look into that. We will have to fix that problem. We will have to revise our work plan so we can focus on this. We'll have to drop everything and get on it. Every time she made those comments, she'd infuriate her team, who simply wanted her to tell the truth. When I asked her why she continued to talk this way to her team, she said, I was just trying to be inclusive and reinforce the priority. She also said she wanted to let them know, I'm here to support them. So I asked her, then why don't you ask them what looks like help? It was a light bulb moment for her. She tried to change how she communicated with her team, but found it difficult. She probably still does. I coached her team to simply state the facts themselves using phrases such as, Jim will lead that one, or Jim and Stan can focus on that today, and Cliff and Paul will cover for them. It's the clarity and the alignment that they wanted, so they created it for themselves. They also role modeled this for her by using names and declaring who would take the R for the specific action, never making a blank statement like, we will. The risk with using we when you really mean you is that a new person on the team might actually believe you and expect that you are taking the responsibility, or at least a part of it, to resolve something and therefore defer to you and step aside and focus on something else instead. They may unintentionally drop the ball, disappointing themselves and their peers, maybe even a client all because of that gray area that you created when you were attempting to give direction. 
the most effective direction is always black and white. And as Brene Brown says, clear is kind. So let's not cause any confusion about who is actually being expected to do the work and take action. Your team wants clarity, predictability, and stability. And they're ready to step up to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So why not reinforce who's got the R for the task and trust that they will deliver? You know, at our Biz Chicks monthly team meetings that Tiffany, our operations leader, leads, we often have a lot to cover and we hold a tight boundary of 60 minutes. So I keep an eye out that we're not overlooking saying out loud who's got the R. I want to ensure that none of us walks away from the team meeting not knowing what each of us owns for follow-up. So before we move on to the next improvement, let's not get this one confused with the positive leadership communication style of saying we, when you celebrate or describe the mission that you and your team are committed to. Natalie has mentioned often on the Biz Chicks podcast and here on the Stacking Your Team podcast that one of the transformations she embraced when she stacked her team was that she changed her stance of calling the business hers to calling it ours. She often uses we in celebration moments and encourages us to own the fact that the business's success is all of ours. Okay, here's the second one. Stop referring to your team as employees, contractors, my workers, my staff, or my people. Instead, refer to them as your team. Using the word team ensures a sense of belonging, compounded brilliance, and of course, it correctly implies that everyone is striving for the same goals, serving the same mission. Here's why. Using labels that position people as less than or below is degrading. I once overheard a business owner who happened to be a guest on a podcast refer to his operations leader as his deputy. Ugh. I near cried for that operations leader, who I am sure has a ton of attributes that round out all the jagged edges of his CEO, much to the delight of the extended team, thank heavens. Referring to people with their name and their title and a short reference as to the impact they're having in the business reinforces to them that they matter. It also makes it crystal clear that you appreciate them as a person, not a possession. Linked to this one is the suggestion to stop using the phrase, he works for me, and instead get into the practice of saying, we work together, or we work alongside each other. Can you feel the shift? Labels and phrases like, he works for me at the Montreal location, can be interpreted by that team member that you feel that you own him, and that's never a great feeling. Now, I can hear some of you saying, well, it's true. The guy does work for me. (laughs) Yes, he does. Yes, you pay him. But he's his own person, and he always will be. He wants you to respect him and the impact he has on the business. So choose words and phrases that positions him well. It's a fact. How leaders make their team members feel is a huge factor in retention. You've heard it before. People quit bosses, not companies. I'm sure you know someone who has left a great job because they simply felt unseen, unheard, and underappreciated. I know I do. I've done it myself a few times. Back at that Fortune 50 corporation I worked at, my team members often told me that they appreciated how I interacted with their family at social events and when I bumped into them, like at the grocery store. With most of them guys, they'd introduce me to their wives and their children as, this is my boss, Shelly. And I'd always respond with, your dad and I work alongside each other. It was the truth. Their success was my success and vice versa. We were always in it to win it together, regardless of the role titles and the pay. And I was conscious of their desire for their family to respect them as providers and for their expertise that they shared, leaving the house every day and going off to work. It's a simple thing, but it's incredibly powerful. If I still haven't convinced you of this one, how about considering this? You often hear me say that leaders tell me that they want an up level in performance across the entire team, but they don't know how to encourage it. Mm Mm-hmm. I get it. You want people to stop thinking like employees and start thinking like business owners. So let's stop calling them employees. 
The transformation in ownership that leads to strong results starts with a shift in identity. So reinforce their contribution and their impact by referring to them as a team member instead. Here's number three. Stop punishing the whole team for one person's error. Many leaders respond to performance outage by painting everyone with the same brush. That's never a good approach to providing feedback and addressing a drift from your core values. And here's why. Your reluctance to host a wonder one whereby a difficult adult conversation needs to take place is obvious when you address the entire team instead, essentially offering punitive feedback to everyone, even though everyone isn't at fault. Other times, leaders will fast track a policy that covers the outage and outlines the intended expectations. Believing the policy will cover it in a difficult coaching conversation. Well, it doesn't have to happen. Can you see that when you offer blanket feedback that really should have been provided to one person, the extended team feels awful about being confronted about something they didn't even know about? And if your team is immature, they'll spend valuable time speculating and gossiping about who the culprit really is. Now that's not helpful at all. And here's number four. Start asking more questions about their health and well-being. And start doing it by making it normal to talk about burnout in your team meetings and your one-to-ones. And here's why. Burnout is real. Many of your team members are quietly suffering from it right now. Many are afraid to talk about it because they're feeling the pressure of not adding any more pressure to a year that's been overwrought with pressure. They know the business is in recovery. Even for those businesses that had banner revenues, the pandemic impacted everyone and everything. They see you and their peers struggling with all that pressure too, and they simply don't want to add to it by seeming needy. Most often, a conversation about those challenges in a group setting where everyone is sharing ideas about solutions can really help. When you make it normal to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, everyone feels more connected. And when you encourage solutions and things to try, everyone will feel empowered to notice what's going on with each other and develop deeper professional relationships because of the higher level of self-awareness that everyone has. And here's the last team culture improvement that I'll share with you today that you can truly start applying right now. And by the way, this one is linked to the previous one, number four, burnout. Here it is. Start planning projects and requests with realistic timelines and be ready to accept the pushback from your team. Here's why. It's the most common frustration of teams. Seriously. It's prevalent across all industries and all sizes of businesses and all sizes of teams, including online businesses. And here's a fun fact. The size of the team matters. Mm -hmm. If you have a large team with an abundance of people with like-for-like skill sets and ample white space on calendars, then you can play it loose with your requests and expect that the team will always find a way to make it happen. They're able to be agile more easier because they have other people to delegate aspects of the project to and a lot of confidence in their ability to deliver. But capacity is queen. So if your team is small, the risk is that you will overwhelm one or two people. And that can often lead to burnout, even if they're telling you that everything's fine. This month in the Leadership Lab, our training was about strategic planning. And I reinforced the need to actually plan and then stick to it. I also shared a planning cycle that was paramount in my corporate days that they could adopt to take deliberate action each month and each quarter that was linked to their strategic plan, demonstrating to the team how to bring it all alive. By educating their team on how this drumbeat provides predictability and preparation for everyone, it holds the team and the CEO accountable to priorities, timelines, and why that project was a compelling business need in the first place. As leaders, it can feel normal to want everything now, And it's also normal to underestimate the complexity and the time it takes to execute a project to standard. That's why teams are frustrated. Leaders often forget what's currently on the work plan and what was already agreed upon in terms of the priority and the why. 
High-performing teams will push back and gain alignment to stay on course. They're wanting to celebrate the completion of a major project and then take a moment to breathe and refuel and then launch the next one. So be prepared for that pushback and know that they have the business and the team's best interest in mind. After all, being effective and efficient is what you want them to be. You don't want to be that leader with a team who secretly works every night and weekend to get it all done because they don't believe you'll be open to the pushback. You know, the people closest to the work know the most about the work, and therefore, they know the most about any capacity constraints. So here's the thing. Did you notice that none of these improvement suggestions will cost you a dime? No fancy pants spending required. Just your thoughtfulness and your commitment to pour into your team as individuals. And boy, oh boy, the payoff is big. So let's wrap this up. Leaders cast a vision and it's your responsibility to nurture it and play a significant role in developing it. If you cast it and then hand it off to the team to bring it alive without role modeling and without reinforcing the behaviors that it's going to take to bring it all to life, you risk losing so much. Loss of trust loss of great team members, loss of clients, loss of money, loss of respect, and on and on and on. Yes, your team is also tasked to bringing the vision alive and keeping the core values steady because it becomes, well, how we get work done every day, but they also need a leader to live it too. Team culture is everyone's business, and in order to keep it flourishing, everyone needs to keep pouring into themselves as individuals so they can pour into each other. So as we close out for today, what will you do to apply what you just learned here on the podcast about these five team culture improvements that you could make happen today? Let's recap them. The first one, stop using we when you really mean you. Number two, stop referring to your team as employees, contractors, workers, or my people. Number three, stop punishing the whole team for one person's error. Number four, Start asking more questions about everyone's health and well-being. And number five, start planning projects and requests with realistic timelines. So which one of those stung the most for you? And which one has your team already spoken to you about and asked that you lean into? Well, here's a suggestion for what you can do to help turn this around. How about for the rest of the week, you become a watcher of your voice and notice every time you begin to call someone anything but a team member and catch yourself. Make the change. It's a habit worth building and your team will appreciate it. You know, leadership can be exciting, challenging, and lonely at times. So don't go it alone. Let me help you create the team and the leadership structure that you've been craving. So until next time, remember, if you have a dream, you need a team. So let's get stacking yours today. 